Okay, let me start with a word of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in my sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Mm -hmm. So today I'm doing something a little different for Sunday school. Taking a week hiatus from going through Bush Shelley's church history book. And I wanted to present this lesson on the gospel of suffering. I've stolen the title from my twin brother, and um, <clears throat> it's, it's a, a theme that uh, I thought about for decades, he has too, and uh, I've actually adapted a lot of this from um, an article he's written that he, he's, I think, going to get published as a book. But let me just start off with a, uh, a quote from his article, and, I, and I, on the outline I put this uh, uh, internet link where you can find this whole article. And his name is Dr. Charles Erlinson. But just as a good story can't be told without conflict or tension, the good news of Jesus Christ can't be told without suffering. Indeed, while suffering is often seen as a reason to reject the existence of a good and loving God, in reality, without suffering, without the cross, there is no gospel. So I propose to look at three parts. Actually, I'm going to have a quick fourth uh, out, um, uh, component. But the, so the, the first main section is the meaning of the title. In what sense is suffering good news? How can we call it the gospel? Then I'm going to look at, secondly, try to prove that there's no valid reason for sinners ever to be upset with God or disappointed Him. Third, there's no valid reason for believers ever to be upset with God or disappointed with Him. And then finally, I'm going to give a quick example from my own kidney stone filled life. So let's begin. <clears throat> the title. In what sense is suffering good news? And again, the title is... Um, the Gospel of Suffering, Why Suffering Can Be Good News. So Gospel, of course, from the Greek, oiangelion, uh, the good news. It means good news. First, I do not, and this is point B, a uh, 1B on the outline, I do not mean that all suffering is good news for those who suffer, for the one who suffers. Think of Revelation 14.10. Uh, the cup of God's anger, which will torment the fire and brimstone, forever, that's not for the good of those who are in hell. Uh, it's their just judgment. Uh, but it is for God's good. Right? 1C, point 1C. I do not deny that in some sense all suffering is good, since God does use it for his glory. Here I've cited 1 Peter 4.11, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Think of 1 Corinthians 10, 31. There's a lot of these passages. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, question, answer one. Our chief end is to glorify God, enjoy Him forever. And then point C, three under this first Roman numeral. God gains glory in giving sinners their just punishment. As this shows his power over sin, his justice towards the damned, and his mercy towards the saved. I think particularly here I've quoted Romans 3, 5 through 6. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? And then, of course, Romans 9, 22 and 23, the potter and the clay, Esau and Jacob. Verse 22, Romans 9. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. So in other words, <clears throat> there is a sense in which um, we're saying here all of God's works bring him glory. Okay? Um, and even suffering, as we'll see, redounds to his glory. Whether he's uh, uh, using it as judgment or using it as a means to make us more like Christ. So point 1B, I, I'm not embracing Eastern fatalism. 
I'm not calling evil good, Isaiah 520, because I admit that in and of itself, suffering is not good. Only its results are good. And this is under point B2. Think of Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I also cite Ephesians 5.20 in the outline, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Um, the commandment to give thanks in all circumstances uh, doesn't apply to giving thanks for the suffering in and of itself, but of the results of the suffering. Same thing with Philippians 1.29. Paul calls suffering a gift. It's been given to us to suffer. And we'll unpack on how it's a gift for believers later. So, again, back to Eastern fatalism, point three here, uh, or uh, D3, under Roman number one. I'm not saying that we should be fatalistic, we just accept karma, that we should never seek to avoid pain and suffering. On the contrary, depending on your motives, it's good to develop drugs that alleviate pain. It's good to use painkillers. I use them. It was okay for the Tutsis to run away from the machete-wielding Hutu neighbors during the Rwandan genocide in 1994. And Paul implies this in 1 Corinthians 7. I'm going to look at verse 21. Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. In other words, Paul says it's good to be liberated from slavery if you can do so for legitimate means and for legitimate reasons. So final point in this Roman number one about what do I mean how the suffering can be good or can be part of the gospel. I mean that suffering is good news for us, not just for God's glory, if we are part of God's chosen people and if we look at it the right way. All right, so my second big picture now uh, there is no valid reason for sinners ever to be upset with the Lord or disappointed in Him. But my main focus will be section 3 on there's never any reason, or at least no valid reason, for believers to be upset with the Lord or disappointed in Him. So point 2A here. In and of myself, apart from God's gracious gifts, there's no true virtue, no spiritual good. I cite Isaiah 41, 14. Uh, Jacob is just a worm. Israel is just a worm. Jeremiah 17, 9, our hearts are deceitful, desperately sick, wicked. Um, my favorite verse that I put here maybe is Luke 17, 10. This is under uh, A3. Jesus is, is telling this story. So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Uh, it's my favorite part one of my favorite parts of the Church of England's 39 Articles of Religion, it's in Article 14, they quote that, to say you can't do any works above what God requires. God never is in your debt. When you've done everything he commands, and he commands be perfect, Matthew 5, 48, uh, Deuteronomy 27, 26, um, he owes you nothing. Romans 7, 18, Paul says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willingness present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Therefore, uh, point 2B, wait, or not 2B. <laughs> That's, no, it is 2B. Uh, therefore, the Lord doesn't owe me anything except the unending torment of hell. I'm God's debtor. I'm never his creditor. I'm in debt to him. He's never in debt to me. Again, Romans 11, 35, 36. Paul's quoting Job. Who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. God never owes you anything, at least nothing good. First Corinthians 4, 7, which is the verse that really changed St. Augustine of Hippo. He had really been a strong opponent, a, a proponent of free will. But this verse really convinced him of, of predestination. 1 Corinthians 4, 7, For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? That is, as a gift. And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? And then Roger Yancey's favorite passage, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, right? Um, I didn't uh, quote it in the outline that I just alluded to, but 
For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself. The antecedent there is faith. It's, a, it's the gift of God, the, lest any man should boast. Um, so, to sum up this section here, the last three points here, on 2C through E. I am so wicked that any suffering I undergo, we'll talk about my kidney stones later, it's only an insignificant fraction of the suffering I deserve. I don't deserve nearly a thousand times that suffering, but infinitely worse. Point D, <clears throat> therefore, whenever I am suffering, the more valid question than why me, Lord, is why not me? I richly deserve this. Point E, if I ever am angry or disappointed with God, it's because I have a false understanding of who I am and who God is. Therefore, I have false expectations of what he owes me. In other words, it's ignorance of scripture that's the problem. Scripture, far from promising us a life free from suffering, guarantees that we'll suffer. There's not some bait and switch or false advertising. Um, and then point F, I guess there, there's one final section uh, in point two here. <clears throat> the question, why do the righteous suffer, is an ignorant question. As the suffering of those who are righteous is an empty set. Now, you, you might say, what about Jesus Christ? And, and you can make that case clearly, right? Uh, Hebrews 4.15, he's sinless. He's personally sinless, though. But if you look at 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to become sin. He stainedeth our sin on the cross. The Father is not unjustly pouring out wrath on the Son, as we'll see later. He's so joined with us. Um, he shares in our suffering, but he also bears our sin. Um, and, oh, this must have been almost 40 years ago in Rabbi Kushner's book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. I couldn't stand that book. It, it solves the problem um, of suffering by denying God's omnipotence. It also denied God's intelligence. In other words, if God could foresee that he'd be unable to prevent so much human misery after he created the serpent and created Adam, which is what Rabbi Kushner says, then why did God create them? Rabbi Kushner implies that God's not just uh, finite in power, but he's not very bright. That's, it says, it's not at all a biblical argument. Someday I want to write a book, When Good Sales Happen to book, Books with Bad Theology. When Good Sales Happen to Books with Bad Theology, but I don't think I'll need a full book. And the Cliff's Notes version is Heresy Sells. All right, now, so the main section here, point three. There's no valid reason for believers ever to be upset with the Lord or disappointed in him. So 3a, all these reasons from section 2 still apply, right? Uh, Romans 7, 18, Paul speaking as believer in his flesh, sarks in his sin nature, you, however you want to render it, uh, there's no good thing. And then 1 Corinthians, pardon me, 1 Timothy 1, 15, Paul uses the present tense, I am the chief of sinners. I think he's doing that for a reason. Believers too are sinners, and we must not forget that. Now let me look, look at, introduce this following syllogism, because I'm going to come back to the logic here again and again, to prove that if you're a follower of Christ, you have an extra reason to expect suffering. Not because you're a sinner and deserve it, which you can argue, right, you need to be disciplined and chastised and corrected, but precisely because you're a member of Christ's body, not in spite of the fact that you are, you should expect suffering. So here's my syllogism, major premise, point one. Whoever is a member of Christ's body will suffer. After all, when the head of the body suffers, the rest of the body will share in the suffering. Point two, I am a member of Christ's body. The conclusion, therefore I will suffer. So let's look at biblical support. This is section 3C for this argument. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world will love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. You see this 2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 11. Paul is always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. And the passage I'll come back to the most, Colossians 1, 18 through 24, and I want this to sink in. 
Colossians 118, and then I'll skip to 24. He, that is Christ, is also head of the body of the church. Colossians 124. Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Let that sink in. The church, Christ's body, is filling up what is lacking in his suffering. Just a simple example, which we will elaborate further. When I stub my toe, I won't do it now, I did it earlier today, my whole body in some sense feels the pain, assuming I have a properly functioning nervous system. Likewise, when a kidney stone is tormenting uh, me with pain for hours, the head of the body, Christ, feels my pain. And we'll get to this uh, later, but 1 Corinthians 12, 26 is hard to overstate it. Paul's that chapter of heaven, the body's all connected, the ear, the eye, the hand are all connected. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Again, the eye, ear, hand, all the members of the body, all the parts are inseparably connected. So I have uh, point 3b. Therefore, suffering is necessary for our union with Christ. Our union with Christ is necessary for participating in God's nature, or imitating it, what the Eastern Orthodox would call theosis. Think back to King Ray's sermon a few years ago on Ephesians 5.1, Imitate God. As we'll see, you have to be careful with that injunction. Um, you're not God, um, so you, you have to be careful with that. First, uh, B1. <coughs> under section 3. It's necessary for the life of Christ, uh, for the God-man, including his suffering, to be communicated to us in order for us to share in God's presence, power, and love. D2, therefore the incarnation, that is the union of God and man in Christ, that is necessary for us to share in Christ's obedient life, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his session, his being seated at the right hand of the Father. Galatians 2.20, right? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In other words, I act vicariously in Christ. When Christ was suffering the cross, so was I. So were we, the members of his body. His cross is our cross. Galatians 5.24, right? Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That implies a sacrifice, a type of suffering, not giving in to your short-term pleasure. A um, bunch of other verses here, Ephesians 2, 6, even now we are seated in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. All that imagery of union. And then third, 2 Peter 1, 4, Peter talks about how we might become partakers of the divine nature. We are called to partake in his nature. Point four, this occurs through union with Christ. Now again, we have to be careful. We're not pantheistically, ontologically joined with Christ. Um, it's a spiritual union. It's a legal or covenantal, a moral or volitional union. Our wills are united with him. His spirit dwells in our hearts and so forth. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll speed through these, but just, uh, I go to John 15, the vine and the branches. High priest in prayer, John 17, I quote. Jesus prays that we'll be as one with him as the Son is with the Father. The imagery of the head and the body we've looked at, a stone in the whole temple, the union of uh, husband and wife in sex, Ephesians 5. Uh, so many imageries of how we're uni united with Christ. Then point five, think of Acts 9, 4. When the Damascus Road, Jesus confronts Saul. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, who art thou Lord? I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. You persecute the body, the head feels it. You're persecuting Christ. Head and body are one. When one member suffers, all suffer. Back, as I said earlier, 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And this is really important. The church and Christ, they share not only physical suffering, but mental, spiritual energy. All suffering, not just the Roman sword, not just persecution, is used by God to make us more like Christ. My headache, my kidney stone, it can be all used and should be used to make us more like Christ. And what believer doesn't want to be more like Christ? 
Now here's kind of the main event, and I'll have to speed through this. Section 3E. As believers partake of Christ in his suffering, God changes their suffering into glory and into joy. Okay, and I've got so many passages here. Uh, I'll just scratch the surface. So many passages say that God changes our suffering into blessing. Right, Matthew 5.10, blessed are they which are persecuted. Romans 5, 2 through 4, exult in your tribulations, it will openly produce hope. Romans 8, 16 through 18, I'll just quote 17, Romans 8, 17. If we're children, we're also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. 2 Corinthians 1, 5, just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. Philippians 3, 10, right? Fellowship of the sufferings. James 1, 2, consider it all joy. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 16. I'll just read verse 13 and following. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Then verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God. In other words, the cross fills us with hope uh, because it reminds us that those who participate in the crucifixion will participate in his resurrection. The Lord's Supper reminds us of this, right? Uh, we need to take up our cross daily. In fact, the whole gospel is kind of an example of God turning evil into good. He turns that tree of death into the tree of life. Uh, Galatians 3.13, he turns it from a curse into a blessing. Last few points here, this is point uh, two here. This doesn't mean we're masochists or that God's a masochist. Uh, I, I'm going to have time to glance this topic. So why did God create man? If he knew that the fall of the first Adam would necessitate the cross for the second Adam, why not just enjoy the perfect society of Father, Son, Spirit? Or just cherry pick, use your crystal ball and pick create Gabriel, Michael, not create Lucifer. Well, we're told, Isaiah 53, 10, it was the Father's good pleasure to bruise Christ. Again, it's not a goal in itself, but it's a means to a greater goal. Uh, the crucifixion of Christ brought the Lord pleasure, brought the Lord pleasure because it teaches us to be thankful. It displays a sacrificial love, right? Where sin abounds, grace abounds. God cannot show forgiveness if there's no forgiveness of sin. Romans 5.20, right? As I said earlier, Romans 3, 1 through 8. God can't show he punishes sin if there's no sin. So it's uh, the glory, delight, pleasure that results from the fall and from the cross. Um, that outweighs the pain and grief because it displays God's power, love, and just, uh, and his just wrath. It's like John 16, 21. A woman who is in labor will undergo sorrow and pain, but once the product, the baby's born, that out, pleasure outweighs uh, the pain. And then finally here, these last few points, point three here. If even Christ the head suffers, the master suffers, and had to be humbled through suffering, we're going to have to suffer too. I mean, we're not better than Jesus. Uh, Philippians 2, right, he humbled himself. Hebrews 2, 9 through 10, he was made perfect through suffering. Hebrews 5, 8 through 9. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. So finally here, it seems that, uh, or penultimately, uh, you might say, well, why is humbling yourself going to make you exalted? That seems paradoxical. Well, the reason is, you know, why will the last become first? Why will the least become greatest? The world's been turned upside down by sin, Acts 17, 6. Sin disorders the world. Therefore, to put it right, we have to go in reverse, okay? Um, it doesn't mean suffering, point five, is instantly turns into joy. Um, but God can use it to produce these good results. Acts 16, 25, Paul and Silas are singing God's praises where they've been unjustly thrown into a dungeon. God uses that not only to make them more like Christ, but to convert the Philippian jailer. Um, said in, in the, the, my... This is my last major point, then I do a, a quick coda. Keep adding points here. Suffering humbles us by reminding us 
not to think we're self-sufficient. It reminds us we depend on God for everything. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, Paul was grateful that he was given a thorn in the flesh to uh, keep him from exalting himself. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Verse 9, therefore I will be content with weakness, with insult, with distress. When I am weak, then I am strong. It also reminds us of Christ's suffering of others. So the final section here, I just reflect on my kidney stones. I'm not saying that um, I like the pain my kidney stones bring me. That's why I try to hydrate more. But I do conclude the following. First, God's the one who's giving me the kidney stone pain. You can look at Deuteronomy 32, 39. 1 Samuel 2, 6 and 7, all those passages. Um, he's the one who brings, who wounds. He's the one who kills. He's the, he's the one who uh, brings suffering. But it humbles me. Uh, whenever I've had them, it keeps me from presumptuously assuming I deserve to be healthy and free from pain. My first thought whenever I have a kidney stone attack is, Lord, how have you held back the hand so long? I deserve this pain times a million. It's made me realize I'm not self-sufficient. I need God for all things, even my health. Um, it's also humbled me. I tend not to want to God to ask, want to ask God for things. I want to be self-sufficient. It keeps me from presuming on His mercy. I have to humbly get on my knees and ask if it's Your will, James 4:15, and if it'll bring You glory, like the blind man in John 9. Heal my, heal me, remove my pain. It makes me think more of Christ's suffering, which deepens my thanks for His suffering. It makes me think of the suffering of others. I start praying for my, uh, my brothers and sisters and neighbors in pain. And finally, it's prompted me to slow down, to hydrate more, to be a better steward of my body and my health. So when we reflect on suffering from a biblical lens, uh, the question becomes not why suffering, but when will I yield to it? When will I submit to it? When will I... Uh, uh, see for what is a way to make me more like Christ.